Ron Nabon for the Midlow Center on July 8th, 2016. Mr. Nabon, do you get permission for this interview? Yes, I do, of course. Can you give us your full name? Uh, Rano P. Nabon. When and where were you born? I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, May 11, 1947. Okay. So, did you always live uh, in that neighborhood? Uh, I grew up in the Seventh Ward uh, in Corpus Christi Parish, and uh, uh, I lived there my young life. And I, when I went to uh, college uh, at Loyola and Tulane, I moved uptown. Okay. And uh, after I finished from uh, undergraduate and law school, I spent some time in the military and uh, Fort Benning, uh, Fort Sill. Uh, then when I came back, uh, I spent some time with the U.S. Department of Justice uh, with a field office down here, but I also spent some time in Washington, D.C. But most, except for my military uh, time and the time with the Justice Department, I've lived in New Orleans. Both grew up downtown and after uh, finished from school and during school lived uptown and lived uh, on the fringe of the French Quarter, Treme, for a while. Okay. So do you consider yourself an uptown or downtown? Uh, downtown, definitely. <laughs> so even if you live uptown, you're still at heart a downtown? That's right. I said uh, I, I was born in the 7th Ward, went to Corpus Christi School, Corpus Christi Parish, an altar boy, went to St. Aug High School, uh, and said uh, consider my, and my childhood friends were all from the 7th Ward. 7th Ward, boy. Okay, well, that's the way I feel about the 9th Ward. When I right. came back, I wouldn't look for any place past I went asked him. Right. And even though after Katrina I was supposed to see uptown for a couple of months, I'm still a downtown. No, so I said, I, I consider myself a downtown Southern Ward boy. So you went to high school? Yes, sir. St. O. Yes, sir. What was it like? Oh, it was great. Uh, I, again, uh, as I, older I get, the more I realize how fortunate I was okay. uh, with my family uh, in terms of the values they taught me, in terms of uh, teaching me the values of hard work and study and excellence in doing things. Uh, that, you know, my father, neither my father nor my mother finished from high school. I was the first in my family to finish high school, much less college or law school. Wow. Uh, but again, I got a good background in terms of values they taught me. And when I went to St. Aug, there was a tremendous faculty there uh, that taught us some things, I mean, especially some of the priests, Father McManus, who got Everybody me involved. Everybody Father McManus. Yeah, he, he got me involved with the, the Urban League uh, Youth Corps, okay? okay. Uh, then a, another one of my favorite teachers uh, was Father Philip Berrigan, yeah. who was a, a real activist. His, his, his brother, brother was Daniel Berrigan, who died a few years ago, and they were real active, and said those were the ones who, along with uh, 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 Father, Father Hall, Father Verrett, yeah. I mean, they and again, all the teachers were great, but those were the ones that influenced me in terms of social awareness, hard work, uh, academic excellence, and I said uh, I feel fortunate to have been formed by those guys. Okay. So you graduated with uh, Val Ferdinand, Kalamu Yasalan, in uh, your class? Or you were... I think Val may have been a year ahead of me. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think he was in 64. Yeah, he was a year ahead of me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you obviously formed some lifetime friendships. That's right. With some of the people there. And again, I said, at that time, I said it was an interesting time in history because in my uh, ninth grade class at St. Aug, that was the first year the Catholic high schools were integrating. Right. And we had to take a test. And they picked the nine highest uh, scores from black kids from the black Catholic schools. Ten, I mean. And from Epiphany, you know, uh, uh, Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi, all the black parochial schools. And it, it, it selected top ten who, who finished from that. And I, I met some friends. Of that ten, only one decided to go to a previously all-white school. And that was a young man named Adams. I remember okay. Adams that said he went to Jesuit. Okay. He was one of the first African Americans to graduate from, uh, from Jesuit High School. But all the rest of us either went to Xavier Prep or St. Aug. Most went to St. Aug and we became good friends and said, and talking to everybody in hindsight, none of us regret it. That was the best decision we ever made. <laughs> well, Ken Carter mentioned he was supposed to go to St. Aug, too, because he mentioned taking the test and uh, came out first in physics mm -hmm. and was going to go to St. Aug until the principal at Xavier Prep found out and said, no, he's went to the Blessed Sacrament Nuns 
Was that St. Monica? St. Monica. He's going to stay there. Mm -hmm. So like the, the free tuition convinced his parents that would be a good deal. And look, I said, we were, I was lucky to get a scholarship at St. Aug. I mean, I said, uh, you talk about it was free tuition, but I think at that time it was about $20 a month. Right. <laughs> but that was a lot of money for my family. Oh, okay? yeah. Uh, so we, I was lucky, I said, in terms of uh, the foundation I was built in terms of my experiences. Did you play any uh, sports? No, everybody, uh, played basketball. everybody and they said uh, I, I was not a very good athlete. I was uh, thin and I was more of, of a geek. Uh, we had uh, we had some good athletes. I mean, yeah. we, we had some really good athletes. Football, I played baseball, which was the, yeah. which where all, all non-athletes play it. Okay. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> my pride, one of my high accomplishments at St. Augustine said even though I wasn't an athlete, uh, our class, and we were ranked, we had academic grades, A, B, C, D classes, and that's, I was in the A class, and we weren't the best athletes, but we won a, the, our senior intramural thing. It said okay. against, you know, it said, uh, so we were proud of that, and okay. I, I still have my little belt <coughs> in that intramural championship. Well, I know most people had basketball. I mean, that was, Look, we had, we had a fantastic before basketball. Before and after the school? We had a team that went up to New York and played uh, in a uh, Catholic thing up there against Powell Memorial. Yeah. We won everything, and our team lost to Powell Memorial. And wow. at that time, Lou El was there. In fact, he was there. He should have been in your class. He, he was. Had. And that's, I said our team lost to his team in the finals. Right. And I said uh, during that same time I was at St. Aug, and our senior, we had, a get, we had a great team that was undefeated. We had the famous closed court game against Jesuit High School. Right. Jesuit High School was undefeated. St. Aug was undefeated, and Father McManus and our principal said, you know, why can't, you know, I said, both, you know, both of us were, were bragging about we had the best team and everything. Right. So I said, well, you know, why can't we let these kids play? Legally, we couldn't play, okay? Right. Uh, but uh, they, they went to Jesuit gym. It was a closed gang. The only people admitted were the parents of the Jesuit kids. No parents from St. Aug kid. I didn't even know they were parents. They had some parents from, from for Jesuit kids. Okay. Uh, and it was a closed game at Jedrick Gim up on Carrollton Avenue, and St. Aug team beat them by 20 points. I thought it was two points. No, that's what the Jedrick people say. Oh. <laughs> it was not well, close. Uh, now, now, Alberta, now what they say, because I, when I went to Loyola, I went to, to school with one of the Jedrick kids, and he yeah. claimed one of their best kids, his parents wouldn't allow him to play. Okay. So that was their excuse. Okay, well, but I we, it was 20. we wiped him out double digits. Okay. It may have been 23, okay? okay well. It was not close. I, there was a movie made where they made it a close game. Yeah. And, you know, to give suspense to it, they had St. Aug win the buzzer beater, but it right. wasn't close. St. Aug just ran him out of the gym. I'm not surprised, but that's <laughs> what I'd hurry. Yeah, no, but if you check the records, it okay. said, uh, uh, because uh, was Harold, Sylvester? Harold Sylvester was on that team, yeah. uh, but the best kid was a, a guy. Oh God, he was great. He was only six three. I found out later, but he, he played like he was seven feet tall. Right. And they won defeated. Yeah, they won the state championship. So you were not offered uh, scholarships outside of the state. Yes, sir. I was. Okay. Uh, at that time, I said we had uh, again uh, a lot of people were offered scholarships from our senior class, and I was offered scholarships to uh, NYU, Vanderbilt, uh, and I had a commission an, uh, to uh, Military Academy at West Point. Okay. My mother, remember this was the mid-60s, my mother didn't want me to go into the military. Right. Uh, and that, you know, she convinced me she wanted me to stay in town, so I went to Loyola, and I had a, a presidential scholarship to Loyola. So Louis Saltney was, what, a year before you? Because I remember he got one of the first presidential scholarships. Well, he got... Uh, uh, he was ahead of me, and I said he he got uh, a presidential scholarship and went to uh, a, a northeast school. Yeah, somewhere yeah, in northeast. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember he was on the first page, front yeah. page of the newspaper. Right. That was shocking. And I said we had a lot of kids who got national merit scholarships. Right. I didn't get a national merit. I was uh, uh, made the uh, semifinals. Semifinals. That was semifinals. Uh, but we had some smart kids in there. I said and. Uh, a lot of our kids went to you know college and everywhere else. And I said the other good thing about Saint Olaf was during the summer, uh, they would send us to prep schools. Yes. Uh, in my sophomore year, and again, this is why I consider myself lucky, uh, went to Amherst one year oh. in my junior year. But before that, I went to Jackson State. And that was the year my mother was afraid, and my mother was more concerned about me. Yeah. But that was the year, but I, I'm glad I went, I went to Jackson State the summer 
uh, they killed Major Evers. 1963. That's right. And I said, I went there, and I remember getting off the train, and they had somebody pick me up and went down Jackson. It was a ghost town. Yeah. You know, all the stores were empty. And at uh, Jackson State, you know, we, I think it was part of the national effort for science and math. So we took science and math. But we were at Jackson State. It was state school. But all the civil rights activity was taking place at Tougaloo. Hmm. And I said, Tougaloo, we would sneak over to Tougaloo because they didn't want us getting involved or getting arrested, okay? But Jackson State, we got some good math and science courses, but uh, things were happening in Jackson at that time, and we would sneak over to Tougaloo to uh, participate with those guys and women, ladies, who were involved with civil rights. But that was the year Matt Garrett was, and it was real tense. I remember, in fact, I was on a panel with uh, his brother, who I was surprised was still living. And I remember uh, we were going to the NAACP convention in Chicago two weeks after Meg had gotten assassinated. And we stopped at the bus station in Brookhaven. I never even heard of Brookhaven. And I reported the incident to Charlie Evans, and his response was, do you know you're in Mississippi? Oh, he wasn't sympathetic. Uh, but he felt, you know, you better be careful. you got to know where you are. Oh, look, you mentioned Brookhaven because I took the train. And I guess that's the century train that went up to Chicago. And that's yeah. the first time I've been on a train. First time I left New Orleans. Right. So my mother, I had an uncle who was a, a red cap. He got me on a train. I passed through Brookhaven, you know, and, and meeting folks from Mississippi. I learned about Philadelphia, Mississippi, yeah. Moss, Mississippi, yeah. a Meridian, you know, Laurel. I, I, I met a lot of good people from Mississippi that summer. And I said, uh, and I was glad, you know, I had the chance to go to Jackson State that summer. That was good. Well, that was the one thing about to know that was so wonderful. Not only did you get a good education, but you got this sense that you had a social responsibility to make the world better. And you mentioned everybody, uh, I think you're the third Teno graduate I've interviewed, and everybody talks about Father McManus. He yeah. was tremendous. Not only was he a good math teacher, but he had a good sense of awareness about the world around him. In fact, he taught me how to fill out the complicated voter registration form. Well, you know, you mentioned and said uh, before the 65 Civil Rights Act was passed, part of what we were doing, and said that in terms of Father Mack and Father Berrigan, I mean, Berrigan was close to me because I was what they call prefect of sociality. Yes. We had tutoring class in St. Bernard Project. We had an apartment we'd go there and teach. But Father Mack was involved with the Urban League. Right. And said we were getting involved <clears throat> with uh, some things and, and, again, prepare people to take the tests. Right. Uh, the liter so-called literacy test to, right. to register. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, no matter what you did. But we would try to prepare people for some of the crazy questions. Right. And I said, you know, uh, you know, how many bar bars, bu bubbles in the bar of soap, you know, recite the preamble to the Louisiana Constitution. Constitution, all that kind of stuff. And I said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but that's, we were involved with that type of stuff. But you finished law school. Yes, sir. And when you did, what did you do? Well, uh, before I finished law school, uh, I finished from Loyola undergraduate school. Okay. And I said, uh, uh, because of my, I guess, experience at St. Olaf, uh, we were part of a coalition of schools in New Orleans. Uh, wasn't much, I mean, we wasn't much activity at Loyola at the time, but uh, uh, we had issues with the fraternities and the Jesuits at the time. Okay. And I said, uh, they, they were sponsors for all the fraternities. And the fraternities, even though technically the school was integrated, the fraternities would have all their socials at segregated facilities. So our student, black student uh, organization protested that. Uh, and uh, we also had a, were part of a coalition with the black student organizations from the other universities. Uh, it Tulane. Was, Tulane had ACT. Uh, I met, that's where um, Kalamu Yas of uh, uh, Valford at the time was at Suno, and I said uh, uh, things were happening in that Loyola at that time, and in coordination with that, uh, all the schools tried to support each other. Right. And uh, we would meet down in the uh, Upper Nine, uh, uh, the community center in the Upper Nine Ward around Desire. In, in preparation to take down the flag. Uh, you know, we wanted to, in brotherhood with our other students. And I recall, I said, we set, went down there, I said, uh, only two of us at Loyola went down there, a guy named Dwight Ott. I don't know if you've heard of mm -hmm. Dwight Ott. Yeah. He was at Loyola with me, and we were part of the so-called activist movement. Uh, but uh, the next morning when we, Dwight lived in, in uh, Punch Train Park, and so we were gonna go down there to join the brothers, 
But before Val and the students from Suno could do anything, the police were there already, waiting for them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one student was able to take down the flag and put it in, in the uh, uh, mailbox, uh, but they, they roughed up some of the kids. Uh, and so, uh, Dwight I did a famous cartoon that uh, I remember one of the best political cartoons I ever saw uh, when we were uh, protesting uh, at Loyola. He had a Jesuit priest, uh, you know, in a black robe, sitting down next to a Ku Klux Klan in a white robe. And because we didn't want to get kicked out, he, the top was he asked a question, will a real Christian stand up? Wow. And they called both, uh, me and Dwight in and said, you know, how can you really, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they said, uh, uh, we thought we both thought we were going to get kicked out, but they... And was Donnelly still president? No, Father Jolly was the president. Oh, okay. Father Jolly was the president. And that senior year, I remember Jolly was the president, and the judge was called us in one night, uh, me and Dwight, because they thought we would have trolled me, cause, and we weren't. Uh, and they were going to bury Leander Perez on on uh, the church on Lyle's campus. Right. And Dwight and I talked about getting some people together, but we couldn't get anybody. Right. So Father Jolly called my house and Dwight's house. My mother was crying. She knew I was going to be kicked out. I was a senior. Dwight was a junior. And they called his house. And we called each other and said, man, you know, you know we're going to get our ass kicked out. You know? And I said, and we couldn't even do it. So we went up to Father Jolly's office that night, and he talked. My, my father went with me because my mother was just crying all night. And Dwight's father went up there. And we went into his office about 9 o'clock. He said, look, we know you guys are active. You know, you, we're proud of what you're doing. You're standing up for the right thing. Uh, but we want to ask you to do a favor for the university and the Jesuits. You know, I said, uh, Leanna Perez is going to be buried here tomorrow. And we would hope that, you know, you wouldn't create any distractions by protesting or picking because we used to do that every once in a while. Right. Uh, and I said, you know, you know, and we know you guys have been trying to get a house for the Black Student Union. We found a place. Wow. So quick pro quo. And, and again, we could we were free, you know, Dwight and I were trying to put and we couldn't put it together. He yeah. said, We're gonna go out there and get our asses kicked, okay? Right. But they he said that Leander Perez, and you know, he was excommunicated. I remember that. And he said that Leander Perez uh took the last sacraments and repented. Okay. And that's why he was able to be buried in the church. Because I remember Usher Hannah was criticized for allowing the burial to take place in church. Yeah, and I said, that's what he claimed, okay? We didn't know, I mean, and yeah. our position was, you know, even if he did repent the last minute, I mean, he still couldn't be buried, you know, it's an embarrassment to the school. Right. Uh, but, you know, we-, we But we you got black. something in return. You got the black house. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> so your parents were supportive of your activities? Uh, my father was more supportive than my mother. My mother okay. was a real religious person. Okay. Uh, my father, was more outgoing. Okay. Uh, it said my my mother was a saint, and my father was a rough guy. Okay. He drank. He gambled. He probably played around. But my mother wanted me to. You know, I said uh, the two values I learned from that. I remember, my mother always taught us to respect everybody. He was a, my father taught us never to fear anybody. Okay. <laughs> he was a boxer. <clears throat> he was a veteran of World War <clears throat> II. He was one of few African Americans to get the bronze star. Hmm when he was uh, for Akin during World War II. A lot got awards in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Right. He got his when he was discharged for his So Akin. where was he in, uh, in the Pacific? Or in well, uh, all my brothers, I mean all my brothers, all my uncles served in the war. I mean they had about, okay. I told you they had seven brothers and all yeah. of them served in the military. Okay. Uh, my father served uh, in North Africa. Wow. Then he went uh, to France and was part of a relief effort uh, for the Battle of Bulge around Bastogne. Okay. And he was discharged after the war. I had, I had un other uncles who fought in Italy, and the one who was in Hawaii uh, was in Hawaii in the, in the Pacific, and he was discharged and stayed in the Pacific. He say that he married in uh, He married uh, uh, a Japanese okay. lady. And they, they're still together. Wow, that's amazing. It's over 70 years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So when you got out of uh, Loyola, you went in the service? No. Uh, remember, at this time, the war was going you on. You kept your 2F department. Uh, I didn't have a 2F department. In fact, I remember my number. Yeah. My number was 68. 
So my number was 27. Okay, well you know what that meant, okay? <laughs> because I would have nightmares. So my number was 68, <clears throat> and uh, I went through ROTC. Okay. Uh, I got my commission as a first lieutenant in ROTC, and that enabled me to go to law school. Okay. Okay. And that bought me time. So I went to law school at Tulane, finished there, and I said, uh, uh, real far, and I said, I, I was working, had jobs, and uh, in my law school, it said I was uh, the third or fourth at Tulane. Uh, we had uh, uh, a, a Rose lady who was the first one to graduate from Tulane Law School, one of the Rose sisters, yeah. then Michael Starks. Yeah, uh, Mike went here with me. Okay, and he was, and then there was a young lady. Uh, she she works at Adam, not Adam Reese, Jones Walker now. Real, uh, and then Don Bernard and I were in that next class. We, I remember because there were only two of us in the class. Right. But we were in the top five right. at that time. Uh, and finished from Tulane, and the war was winding down. Uh, I was able to get a job with the Justice Department for a while, and then uh, with the Justice Department. After I finished, I got a job with uh, Eli Brownstein, Strickler, and Dennis. Wow. It was a, a public interest law firm. Uh, Eli was Lola C. Eli. Uh, Brownstein uh, was from New York, and he headed up the, the prison reform thing he, the, until 10 years ago. He was still there. Dave Dennis was a, a, a an attorney, young attorney at the time, right. but he was a, a freedom rider. Right, from cool. uh, So I got to, again, I, I always seem to be in the right place at the right time, and I worked for them for a while. Uh, and then after that, I worked for Collins and Douglas and Eli. Uh, they were a firm that, uh, downtown, in fact, they were on Camp Street, 344 Camp, I'll That's never right. remember that. They were one of the first black firms to be downtown. Yep. More importantly, they were active in the civil rights movement. They represented Nick and Core, mm -hmm. and I said uh, I <coughs> got involved with them. And I guess that's when I started getting involved with some of the things they were doing. Uh, civil rights. Jack Nelson was yep. a cooperative attorney. Uh, Dr. Francis was of counsel right. even before he became president. He was coming in and out in office every once in a while. Uh, there was another attorney that was a, a mentor of mine, a hero. Uh, uh, Richard Sobel, yeah. uh, those guys I learned from, okay? Right. Uh, and again, uh, we're doing both uh, civil rights type activities uh, and political. Uh, Collins, Douglas, and Eli said, especially uh, Nils Douglas founded Soul. Right. Bob Collins founded Coup. What does Coup stand for? A community Organization for Urban Politics. So were you a founding member of Coup? Uh, yeah, but I was a, I was a real lawyer on the totem pole. I was still in school. Right. Uh, Bob Collins, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, was the, the top guy. Okay. Uh, but he said I, I would work for him. Okay. I would pass out materials and all that kind of stuff. So, right. I, and I would also work for Soul because you know, but again, I was not a founding member. I was just a foot soldier. Right. <laughs> but I learned a lot. So that's where you saw. I learned a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and part of that activity, then, Lois was not as political as Bob and Nils, but he was from Uptown. Right. And at that time, uh, uh, they were trying to get political entities, and this had to be in the early 70s, right after the 70s consensus. Right. And uh, it was redistricting, so the Senate districts and all the House of Representatives districts were redone. Right. And they were involved in getting African Americans to run for those districts, okay? Uh, interestingly enough, before, I started working for Collins, Douglas, and Eli. They represented uh, uh, Dutch Moriel in his effort to be elected to the first state representative to the House. Mm -hmm. uh, a famous, what they call, uh, keynote case involving uh, residency. Uh, Mr. Moriel was living at the uh, time in Moriel. magazine. In, well, he was living in Punch Rain Park, really. Right. But he had a residence uptown. 1201 magazine. And I said, uh, Colin Suggs and Eli represented him successfully at that time, and it was a, the issue was residence as opposed to domicile. Right. So he was able to run and get elected to the House of Representatives. Right. So again, as I said, being lucky in the right place at the right time, I said, uh, uh, I was learned a lot in terms of history, you know, civic involvement, politics from those guys. So you ultimately got involved on the political side. So you were a member of COOP. 
I was a member of Coup, but I was active in Seoul. Whoa, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. uh, because of Neil Douglas. Uh, That's my, right, Nils had run earlier yeah. unsuccessfully in the 60s. My political godfather, uh, Don Hubbard. I don't know if you spoke to Don yet. Yeah, Don. Uh, because I'm going to tell you some stories to, to ask about. Uh, in working with Congress Douglas and Eli, Don, you know, Sherman Copeland, so I worked with all those guys. And part of the process was the downtown New Orleans had coup and so which were relatively new, and they were active in, in obviously, the election of uh, Moon Landry. Right. Uh, uptown, you had the OPPVL, uh, and you had a new young group of uh, folks who were contemporary to me, Ken Carter and them, started bold. bold. And Bold and uh, uh, Reverend A.L. Davis were challenging, and at the time, uh, Clarence Barney said, you know, why are you guys going to put each other? So the Urban League sponsored and organized what they call the Uptown Black Caucus. Yes. And uh, again, <clears throat> I was just a foot soldier in being a, a worker being that. But again, part of that effort to try to, you know, to do that, that was sponsored, you know, by the Urban League. So I was involved with that. But getting back to my, my political godfather, Nils Douglas and, and Don Hubbard, while I was working, while I was in law school and doing these things, uh, they got me involved, said Don got me involved in uh, uh, Free Southern Theater. Really? Yes. See, I had no idea Don had anything to do with that. Oh, Don, I'll tell you. So that's why I was, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you missed him. Okay. Uh, Free Southern Vieta was down, said, uh, on St. Bernard in the office yeah. below Judge Ortiz. Yeah, I remember where it was. And again, it said it was Free Southern Vieta was about Vieta, but they had other things. They had a writing thing. Right. Uh, and Don, that's where I met uh, Kalamu Yaslam, but Don was in charge of the Free Southern Theater newspaper called The Plain Truth. Yeah, he mentioned that. <laughs> and but again, I didn't know it was Free Southern Theater. That was Free Southern Theater. Okay. They, they were funding it, okay, through, I think, the Ford Foundation. Okay. So some of the young writers, we had a writing uh, institute for the Free Southern Theater that Don was in charge of were Bill Roussel, oh, yeah. Kalamu Yaslam, or I think his name is still Valentine, uh, Henry Julian, uh, Dwight Ott, and me. Oh, okay. And we were the writers for the play, true. And Don was our moderate uh, sponsor. Okay. And look, I teased Don because I said we teased Don. and said we don't know if Don can write except for his name on the check. Uh -huh. But he he oversaw us. Right. And we had this running thing going. We were the young progressive blacks uh, dealing with politics. Kalamu was uh, part of the effort to, in terms of literature, he would write poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Bill Roussel, Henry Julian, Dwight and I were the writers for the paper. Uh, and Don was sick us, so he was called sick on the politicians and on issues. Uh, and we always had this thing about being more progressive than established black newspaper at the time, Louisiana Weekly. Well, he mentioned that, which is interesting, <laughs> that he, he, say, he had a conversation with the Jesuit brothers, and they, uh, well, tell him, why don't you do your own newspaper? And it turns out he didn't know how to publish the newspaper, so they printed <laughs> the newspaper for him. Yeah. Well, I thought that was very well, good Well, Mr. Dejwa, and I know the family, I mean, a good guy, yeah. but he and Don had some political difference. Yeah. So Don started the Plain Truth in the Southern, uh, Southern Pre-Southern Theater Theater. Right. Tom Dent worked with you for a while, didn't Tom you? Tom Dent was a writer, and I said he, they were more on artistic side, right. and we were on the com more on the community side. Well, at that time, did you think about getting involved politically and in political running for political office? Uh, at that time, I thought I might want to run for political office, but we had an experience at both Saint. I had an experience at both Saint Aug and at Loyola that said, look. I'm, not, I'm never going to run for anything. And in fact, to this day, I've never run for any public office. Okay. But when I was at St. Aug, I ran for uh, student body president. And uh, we wanted to be avant-garde and everything. And so we didn't promise any more pep rallies or dance or anything. We talked about making the school united and making sure all the students were treated as one. We got wiped out, OK? They beat us five to one. Yeah. Uh, one of my running mates was, uh, oh, god. Uh, he used to be a reporter. He's at Southern University with the uh, Warren Bell. 
Warren, Warren Bell was on my ticket, and we okay. got it wiped out. Then I went to Loyola. Again, I said we were, we were fighting with fraternities. The fraternities control everything on Loyola. It's like doing most campuses. We had a, uh, an alternative ticket, uh, students non-violent coordinating and set out things. We ran and got slaughtered, okay? okay? So I said, I'm not running for anything the rest of my life, and I never did. So when I got involved in politics, I was more in terms of uh, organizational and behind the scene type person. Okay. And that's, that's what I enjoyed doing as opposed to running for public office myself. Well, who were some of the people you met when you got involved with Seoul and uh, Ku, who later became political <coughs> officials? Well, Sanchez, Pete Sanchez. Oh, I've forgotten about Pete uh, Sherman Copeland. Uh, uh, God, the guy from the Night Water. He's downtown. He was a Tom uh, Jasper. Tom Jasper. Uh, uh, Teddy Marshall. Marshall. Uh, Lombard. Okay. Uh, when Judge Augustine uh, was first appointed and elected, uh, working his campaign, uh, when Judge Ortiz ran uh, for for office uh, and was first elected civil court. I was instrumental in his campaign. Uh, then in the coup area, I mean, we backed Jim Singleton uptown. Yeah. In the coup area, we uh, backed uh, Sidney Bartholomew for Senate. Uh, uh, our coach, uh, he was the one, one of the founders. Connors, of the, Nick Connors. Nick Connors, Coach Connors, the state mm -hmm. representative. Uh, when, when Sidney went to the city council. Was that a surprise that he got involved in politics? I hadn't known him. I never would have thought it was, he was. He, he wasn't very political. Right. And again, we were looking for people. And again, Ku was senator in the seventh ward, and, and our colors were saying all colors. Right. So most of the active people in, in Ku were saying all. Okay. And again, I said, you know, the easiest person to elect was Nick Connors. Everybody loved Nick, the coach. Okay. Yeah. Everybody knew the coach. So he was elected to the uh, House of Representatives. Right. And I said he was one of the early member, founders of Ku. And that's, you know, working all this campaigns and everything. That was a surprise. I would have thought he would have been like the band director, stay there for coaching well, forever. You know, and he <clears> did, <throat> and he wasn't. He was more academic and community related. I mean, he was never the typical politician who wanted to go from one office to another. Right. You know, I said uh, uh, that's why he won. Okay, and I said one of the things I felt so bad about uh, was when he was defeated, and it wasn't his fault. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of our founding people uh, was a friend of mine, but we always had political difference. Was Hank Braden? Uh, <laughs> Hank Braden and his family had a family feud going on with the Morials. Mm -hmm. And we'd all say, "Look, Hank, that's not our problem." Okay? Uh, Hank Braden's daddy was a prominent physician, was okay. involved in politics. Hank, you know, actually go there. Said my parents never finished high school, so I mean. Yeah. I wasn't in Hank Braden's class, okay? <laughs> but I said he was a coup member, and I said uh, part of that. And I remember I said uh, uh, I was a supporter of Dutch Morial when Dutch ran, but the, the Bradens couldn't stand Dutch Morial. So we had a big fight. I supported Dutch, uh, got some uh, in a long fight with Coup, and Coup, people forget this, Coup supported Dutch Morial when he ran for mayor. Yeah. Uh, some people don't remember that because they were always, always seemed to be fighting, especially right. Hank. But I said the younger folks, and I, you know, I supported Dutch every time he ran for public office, including the first time for mayor, uh, and Ku endorsed Dutch. You didn't? Did you support the uh, three term? No, nope. okay. uh, I didn't. And I said uh, some people stereotype me as being uh, the Morial antagonist okay. because I said I was active in uh, all three efforts of the Morials to change the charter. Uh, when Dutch tried to change it. Uh, the first time, well, it, was, it, was, terms. it was unlimited terms. And then I, was, I, I helped organize the Citizens Preserve the Charter. When he tried to come back a year later in terms of just one, yeah. I mean, you know, just three. three, you know, I said we, we fought that. Yeah. And then when Mark tried to change, we called it uh, just me because yeah. it was a convoluted way and all that kind of stuff. But I was involved with all those efforts to, uh, to defeat those uh, charter changes. But I remember Father McMahon just mentioned that Chuck Morrison had put in term limits. That's right. He expected to be governor. That's right. And he didn't want a strong man in New Orleans. Right. <laughs> it backfired on him. It did. And again, Chep <clears throat> ran four terms. But again, our present city charter, which was, because uh, I served on some charter commissions too, but our present city charter, which is in effect now, was adopted 
and put into effect in 1954. Right. And again, in 1952, the U.S. Constitution passed term limits for the president. So that was part of that effort, okay? Right. Uh, and Kep served uh, his two terms under the charter and it amounted to four. And then when he couldn't become governor, he tried to change the charter. Right. And we, part of our campaign effort uh, against changing term limits under the Morials was a historic lesson. And we, we, it was based on philosophy. We pointed out that Morrison, you know, no matter how good a progressive a mayor may be, the philosophy, you know, is for term limits, okay, to prevent right. a mayor from coming too strong. So Mar that was before my time. When Morrison tried in 61, it failed 61%. I remember. And then when the Morials passed an interesting thing, even though the demographics has changed in terms of racial demographics of voters, it failed from the four times, it was it failed both times, all four times, between 61 and 60 percent, voters voted against it. Yeah. I remember that because I, I was opposed to uh, changing it. Because I figure if you haven't done it by eight years, there's not much you can do. And more or less is the people around you want you to stay in. Yeah, and I had a philosophy, and again, uh, our organization we formed was based on philosophical opposition. And, and, and Dutch knew this, because every time Dutch ran for office, uh, I supported him. Right. Uh, but again, I had some philosophical issues with it. And then again, my friend Sidney Bartholomew wanted to run. So it made it easy for me to pull it every time the Morials brought it up. But again, I said, even, and, and Mark knew this too, and I said, uh, we, we never ran a campaign that was anti-Morial. Uh, it was based on the philosophy of why we should have term limits for a strong mayor, and again. So what was your relationship with Dutch Morial? Uh, it was, I thought it was friendly and professional. Okay. Uh, I support him. Uh, he offered me uh, and I can say this now, I said, uh, he offered me a job uh, to work in his administration, but at that time I was working with uh, Niels Douglas. Okay. And, and in fact, our firm was representing the Housing Authority. And, uh, uh, but he, I, I sat in and said, look, I know you helped me, he being Dutch. Uh, and I said, you know, you, can, you, can, you know, you know, I'll offer you, you can keep what you have and I'll offer you even more. But he said, you know, I have political issues and personal issues with your partner, Nils Douglas. Uh, so I said, you know, if you were on your own, you could have this, but I can't, I don't, I can't help feed Nils, okay? So I was still young at the time, idealistic, and I said, you know what, I support you, but I'm not gonna leave my partnership. I mean, I, I told you, I admired Nils, was, you know, right. he got, gave my first job, so I wasn't gonna leave. So uh, we never did, you know, I never did work for, uh, Dutch when he was mayor. You never served any commissions? No, not, no, no commissions on him. I said I didn't, I didn't get any appointments. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, you may remember we call the Cedar arrest. Oh yeah. Uh, it involved the Hank Braden campaign, and after Hank won, beat Louis Chauvenet, uh, Mayor Morial was supporting Louis, and almost everybody was supporting Louis. Uh, uh, the police chief from Birmingham was police chief, and he arrested about thirty-six. Young people. I never could understand what was that all about. I don't understand. It was a big mistake. I mean, these kids were not doing anything. My needed. son used to go to the program. Okay, I and I said it was Harry Harold Montgomery, uh, another young guy, another friend, and they were running right over here. I know. And, uh, Jenny uh, Harrison used to be. But the arrest of those kids. His sister was was there, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. And I said I was a young attorney working downtown with uh, uh, Nails's office, and they arrested uh, those thirty six kids, including Harold and. Uh, uh, I can't think of the other man's name. Uh, and I, I remember standing downtown at the uh, Central Lockup when they were processing these kids all night. Yeah. They brought some in and they would bring them in at the change and those kids had to stay there. So we got them all out. Yeah. They were charged with state charges. We worked it out. You know, they didn't, you know, said they were brought before a grand jury because it was seated in federal money. Yeah. They went before a federal grand jury. None of them were ever charged, uh, but they had on a record that we, for years, trying to clear it up, exp trying to expunge the arrest. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, again, that was something that I, uh, I, you know, I said, those kids were innocent, okay? I never could understand it. No. That's so, how my son uh, learned how to ride, he used to go to McDonald's 15, learned how to ride the bus by himself to yeah. go to 
The rap, I think. That's, that's rap, rap. Right. It was rap, yeah. Uh, so, again, in terms of Dutch, I mean, that made some, you know, some freaking between me and my friends about that, okay? Yeah. Uh, and I remember, because it said uh, he knew I had to fight to get Coup to support him. Yeah. Uh, they had some people who were not Morel friends. Uh, if you recall, his opponents were uh, Morrison, and we had strong supporters for Morrison. Nat Kiefer. Nat Kiefer. We had most of the people wanted <coughs> Nat Kiefer, okay? Yeah. And politically, uh, if any one of those two guys had gotten a runoff with Dutch, they would have beaten him, okay? Yeah. Dutch got the only person going to beat DeRosa. DeRosa. But Dutch knew that me and somebody, what do you call a young Turk, Turks and Coom, uh, Ivan Lamel, who's a judge now, right. uh, we worked and supported Dutch. Uh, and we couldn't understand why, you know, why he did what he did with those kids, because they were innocent. I mean, you know, the politicians were a fair game, but when you arrested kids who were yeah. doing nothing. I know my son was about six or seven. He couldn't yeah. understand. So, uh, uh, we had to pick him up. Yeah. Yeah. I never understood that. Now, uh, after all this was going on, I said, uh, uh, I always had a, a you know, a, I could talk to Dutch. Dutch would call me and everything. So after he was out of office, Sidney, and it, this is something that not too many people know about, but Sidney was running for re-election. And Sidney had some issues. He was down the polls, okay? Uh, and uh, I was one of the few people who could talk to Dutch. So there was talk about Dutch even running against Sidney. Okay, so I said, uh, spoke to Dutch, and we worked some things out, and uh, Sydney got the black ministers, Labor, who were the foundation of Dutch's uh, political support. They came out, and Dutch was eventually going to come out for Sydney. Uh, all that had been worked out, uh, but Dutch died right. that uh, that Christmas. Uh, because again, if you recall, in Sydney's election, uh, the ministers came out for Sydney, Labor came out for Sydney. Congressman Jefferson came out of Sydney, and Dutch was going to be the one to bring him over. Mm -hmm. And long term, I can tell you this because it's a part of, not the deal, but the understanding, uh, Dutch was thinking about running for the U.S. Senate. And at that time, you had Benny Johnston, and you had David Duke, who was strong. And Dutch's thinking was just like his thinking when he ran for mayor. I could run for the state, get all the black vote, David Duke get all the white votes, I get in the runoff with David Duke, and I beat David Duke and become the first U.S. Senator. Now, that's news of me. I never heard that. Not many people. It's, you know, look, that was, I'm just telling you well, things. I know that, Dutch I'm not was always thinking ahead of most people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And again, that's one reason why, you know, he said, look, you know, if I support Sydney, you know, will you help us with this thing? Yeah. And that was, you know, that was his long term plan, and it, it had a shot at working. Okay. Because he wanted, you know, as it turned out, uh, Benny Johnson only got in because all the blacks voted for him. David Duke got more white votes I know. than Benny Johnson. And Benny Johnson wouldn't have gotten all those black votes had Dutch been in there. We reminded him of that because then he came out strongly against busing. So you didn't say that when you were yeah. running for uh, re-election. But Dutch and I got to be friends and said, uh, and my, my friends in Coup, like I said, uh, Sidney and Lambert joke about it. Hank thought I was a turncoat. But when Dutch died, because Sybil knew I was friends with Dutch, and when we, even when we ran against the third term, we never said a bad word about Dutch. Right. You know, some people were saying he was corrupt. We never said a, one bad word about Dutch. Right. I always praised him, but said, here's why we should vote against it. Yeah. And I think Sybil and Mark knew that, and I said, uh, one of the little proud things, I'm especially with my friends in Quinn and people who didn't like Dutch and Nails, I was an honorary pallbearer so for Dutch Morale. <laughs> so if you look at your program, you'll see my remember, name on that. I remember that. Uh, your relationship with Sydney? Yes. Uh, Sydney and I are real close friends. Okay. Uh, I'm the godfather for two of his kids. So you had been friends since then? I didn't know Sydney at St. Okay. He was before me. Yeah, he, he was in sixth, so he'd have been eight. Yeah. I met Sydney uh, when I was in Tulane Law School and he was in Tulane School of Social Work. Okay. So uh, that's where I met him. And then I said, uh, we got to know each other in coup because Bob Collins and some of the other folks, uh, the coach taught Sid, was Sidney's coach at uh, St. Olaf. 
and Sidney was a football player. And Sidney, I knew of Sidney Bartholomew because from St. Aug, but Sidney was also finished about four years ahead of me at Corpus Christi. Right. So I followed him and I said, we got to, uh, got to be close friends, Sidney and Lambert and I, uh, through Coop. So did he offer you a position in his administration? Uh, he did. Okay. And I said, uh, people don't, I worked with him, but people always get confused. I never had a job in Sidney Bartholomew's administration. Okay. <laughs> you were uh, a confidant. Yes. Uh, so I worked on a lot of things in terms of whenever he got in political trouble, the Mardi Gras ordinance. So what was your casino. position on the Mardi Gras ordinance? Uh, I was part of the committee uh, to pass, to help get this Mardi Gras ordinance passed. Okay. And again, uh, it was very divisive, obviously. Right. Uh, and it was also a political problem for Sydney because at the same time, Sydney was trying to get the one casino bill passed. Right. So uh, uh, it was the right thing to do, and Sydney backed it. But it was it was a problem in terms of getting the votes necessary to get that casino bill passed. So I was one of Sydney's uh, facilitators working with the committee that had been put together with the uh, with the Mardi Gras coups and the city. And uh, the key sponsor and advocate for the Mardi Gras ordinance was uh, Dorothy Taylor. Right. And I worked with those to try to get it done and said, uh, worked out something. And uh, uh, Bassett, I think his name, I, he's now at City Park, but he was a, a, a Rex member. And Rex was a more progressive Uptown crew, yeah, you had awesome. Proteus and some of the older line crews, Momus and, and Momus, they stopped parading, okay? Right. And uh, help draft some of that legislation. You know, uh, one of my for one of my former partners, who was a city attorney, and that's how he got the job for Sydney, was Oakland Jones, mm -hmm. and he was a city attorney. So we worked on that bill uh, for the Mardi Gras ordinance. In retrospect, do you think it worked? Uh, to be honest with you, it was more symbolic and philosophical than anything else. Uh, you know, the key components to get it done and to get the Mardi Gras crews to accept it that did was that you had to promise to remove all discriminatory language in your in your charters. Okay, okay. you couldn't you couldn't have any blackballing things. You couldn't have anything saying you you discriminated against women, blacks, or any minorities. And you, had to sign, and you had to sign an affidavit. Okay. So some people would argue that it didn't have much teeth, but philosophically, they came on record and saying, we won't discriminate, yeah. and we signed this affidavit saying, we don't discriminate. That was that basis, okay? Well, aren't most of the crews uh, desegregated now? At least I, they seem to be. Yeah, they seem to be. I mean, Rex always had a few of our most prominent African-American citizens, right. uh, and our prominent, the mayor and the prominent uh, folks from the university would be invi invited to Rex Bow. The more conservative crews uh, decided not to roll because the, the legal basis for that Mardi Gras ordinance was that if you use public assets, i.e. the street or police, right. you can't discriminate. Right. And then I, you know, I said, uh, I know uh, the council lady wanted to go a step further and say you had to desegregate your clubs. Right. And that was, that's bridge too far, okay, okay? because the, the, the private organizations under the law are private, and as long as you don't get any governmental assets, you can't discriminate. Right. So that part of the bill was declared unconstitutional in the federal court, and Oakland, Sydney, and I knew that. But it said again, they passed it to try to uh, desegregate the, the clubs, like the, the Louisiana Club and the, uh, the club on Pickwick. Canal Street, Pickwick, and all those exclusive clubs. Okay. The law, even to, to this day, uh, don't you know if you're private, you can discriminate. But most of the new crews are integrated. Oh, the move, In fact, yeah, all of them. Yeah, all, that's all, the new, all the big mega crews and the yeah. new ones are. That's our, that's our the ones that are the biggest now. Yeah. Uh, and if you recall, uh, the big crews, uh, well, I can't think of their names now, the mega crews. Uh, Harry Connick's crew is there. Bacchus. And, Bacchus uh, and, and Demian. Demian. Yeah, all those, are, all those are integrated. You're right. Did you have any uh, personal goals in mind for the city as a private advocate or as somebody who was close to the, the yeah, mayor? My, my, I guess my thing about working in, involved 
with politicians was to try to get some what I call public policy thing. I, I was somewhat of a policy okay. uh, junkie, okay, as opposed to being in front. Uh, I would help put the organize things, write positions. Uh, you know, Ken Carter and I worked together on the Mardi Gras ordinance and on some other things. Ken was part of what we call a Zudu and a Rex Club. You know, uh, I wasn't part of that. You know, those were big right. shots. I said, uh, uh, but what I always was concerned about was getting African Americans elected to public office, and I said, uh, uh, we got that. And after that, and even today, work on public policy. I always thought that elective office wasn't an end. Right. That that could help us get things <clears throat> and open up the doors, but we had to develop public policy for both economic development and social justice. Okay. And if you develop good, strong public policy, you could get those things done better than politicians. Politicians, as some of my polit political friends like Nails and Bob taught me, politicians are by nature people who work for the order compromise to get things done. Right. Being a civil rights advocate is different. Right. You take a position and you push it. You're the gadfly. And one thing Nils taught me, even though he was a politician, he said, know the difference between being a politician and a civil rights advocate. And I said, that's something some of our people get mixed up. But right. I said, that's one thing I learned from Nils, and he was good at that. Oh, well, yeah. That's one reason I never got involved directly in politics. That's right. Somebody has to push. That's right. Always Compromise have, is going to take place, but somebody has to you push. You always have to have that counter pressure to counterbalance what some of the forces of darkness are doing. What was your relationship with Mark Morial? Uh, Mark, uh, he's younger than I am, and again, uh, didn't go to St. O. He didn't go to St. O. He was a Jesuit guy, <laughs> but you know, we he knew I worked with his father. In fact, when we were working on the deal for support in Sydney, and I said, I mean, he may not even want to admit to this, but I'll tell you, okay. Uh, he was part of our negotiating period, okay. okay? So we got to be alone, I said, and I said, uh, I always admired the Morial family. I mean, as I told uh, Dutch and uh, Mark, the best person I admired was his mother. Mm -hmm. I, so I always, and I would see her, you know, I said, uh, she was one of my heroes, and again, I was supported the Morales when they ran. Now, I think when uh, when Mark won, I supported Bill Jefferson. Bill okay. Jefferson and I were closer. We were in the same age group. We worked together on a lot of things. In fact, Bill Jefferson and I worked together to get to allow uh, Dutch to run for office. Dutch was on uh, the court at the time. Right. And there's a law, which still is a law. Right. As a judge, you can't run for a non-judicial office. Right. So a group of young black attorneys and some whites got together and went to federal court and got a temporary strain order in federal court to allow Dutch to run. Right. And I said it allowed him to run and win. The Fifth Circuit eventually overruled it and said the law is constitutional and it's still on the books today. But at that time, he was, already he was there, okay? Yeah. Well, he wasn't elected, but he was against uh, DeRosa, because uh, it came before the state Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, it was against DeRosa, and he, everybody thought he had a shot at winning that. Yeah. But he had won, so again, it gave him time to run and win. Right. But uh, so uh, where I was going was that when, uh, and I'm trying to think, did they run against each other? Well. He ran he, against Jefferson for in Congress, Porto. and that's why I supported Jefferson for Congress. Okay. Okay, but I supported, uh, uh, Mark ran against, did Lambert oh, so run against? He ran Lambert? against uh, Pendleton, right? No, no, no. Pendleton was the police chief. He yeah. appointed the police chief. Oh, he he ran later. Yeah, he ran. I'm trying to think who ran with Mark, uh, Mark ran. Donnie Mintz. Donnie Mintz, yeah, yeah. Donnie Mintz. So I mean, I was I was with Mark okay. because Donnie Mintz ran against Sydney too. Yeah, I wasn't against. So I said uh, I always looked at Donnie as trying to be an interloper. So did you uh, have a good relationship with Mark once he became mayor? Uh just working. Again, yeah. I didn't have any contracts or jobs with him, but I said yeah. that we could talk to each other. And I said, right. I think I respected him and his family. I think he respected me. Okay. So, I mean, that was, that was it. Your relationship with Nagin? Not, no. Didn't have any relationship with him? No. Uh, Did you know him before? I knew him from Cox, okay? okay. I knew him from Cox. Right. Uh, and that was it. Uh, Did you have any relationship with any of the governors? Edwards? Uh, yeah. Uh, Edwards uh, worked in several of his campaigns uh, with uh, Bo Koo and with my good close friends who were close to him, uh, Don and Sherman. Okay. 
So that, uh, and again, I was a little golfer, and I said, uh, Don and Sherman were the big shots, and I would help put together uh, the turnout plans in New Orleans and the state. So did you have any uh, relationship with SSI? Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, our firm represented SSI. In I suits was, against them. Don mentioned I, I, all the time I thought it was just a two person. Oh, no, no. Well, S I found out later it was not. Yeah, SSI said, again, uh, conceptually, it was, a, it was a big thing. And they, uh, you know, uh, they were supposed to get more than they did, uh, but they got uh, security right. and they got uh, maintenance uh, and set up. Right. Uh, and uh, our firm, we worked with Nails at the time, we represented SSI. And again, part of SSI, it was a corporation, and they sold corporate shares to people. <laughs> well, I found out from Don, I didn't know that. Before. Yeah, and that was a big thing. And it yeah. said, you know, the Don was just opening, and it said you had, you had a firm that was owned and operated by African Americans. Right. You know, not just who paid, but owners and were visible. Okay, right. that was part of the problem. I mean, Don, I mean, Sherman always liked to be visible, so everybody knew these African Americans had a big part of the contract. And again, part of the legal issue was they were sued. Uh, oh God, I can say. Did you represent them? And they yeah, we represented them when they were sued. And you won. And I said uh, uh, we won. And again, just to give you a quick basis for it, uh, what they call add-on contracts. SSI had an add-on contract where they would do something for uh, the amount of the services, then they had a right to add on profit. Okay, okay. that was illegal. And it still is illegal under the Louisiana law. But Sherman and Don, being a, the geniuses they are, got a special law passed to exempt the SSI contract from that law. Okay. And that's how we won because the uh, people who sued, uh, it, was, it was the Secretary of State at the time, I uh, forgot his name, they sued and said this violates state law. And we will approve that there was an exemption to the law, a legislative exemption to the law, that allowed this contract. Uh, to be crafted the way it was as an add-on, an extra add-on contract. Well, Don sort of suggested that he thought it was a betrayal by Edwards that he did not defend them. Well, and, and I know I said uh, Edwards was under pressure to get rid of Don. I mean, SSI, yeah. okay? They were, they were controversial. Uh, they were claiming they weren't doing it, but Edwards was under political pressure to get rid of him. Uh, I mean, Don can tell you in more detail than I can. Uh, the governor went to some African Americans and said, "Look, you know, Don and Sherman and SI are too hot. You know, said uh, I'm getting pressure. Would you guys be willing to set up an alternative company and we give you the contract?" Uh, so Don is really, I think, still bitter about that, and I think okay. he was betrayed by the governor. Okay. And again, uh, the governor probably helped encourage that litigation, but once that. We won and found it legal. Don and Sherman had leverage, and the governor had no choice not to just kick him out legally, right. but to buy him out. Well, he made, he praised Treen for not uh, appealing yeah. the decision, right. which allowed them so to that, that, recompensate. So that legal contract gave him the leverage you know, to get even a, a better deal. Had it been declared illegal, they wouldn't have had no leverage, and they wouldn't have, they would have gotten nothing. A uh, couple of quick questions. Any disappointments, anything that you had pushed for that you thought would have been important to the political process that you were not able to get through? Well, uh, I guess the disappointment is that uh, the same frustration, a lot of people were not involved in the political process, that our political leaders are short-sighted Okay. And don't advocate public policies that will help the people. Okay? Uh, that many of our politicians, especially the younger ones, are more concerned about having a title yeah. uh, and being reelected right. than dealing with strong public policy issues, especially uh, in terms of housing, judicial, ref uh, criminal justice reform, economic development. But especially involved in dealing with, when I grew up, I was lucky I was in that transition stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't exactly involved with the civil rights fight that Nils and Don and uh, Eli were involved in, but I grew up in a transition. Uh, and 
the objectives were easier. The objectives were, again, get rid of all the discriminatory laws, right. you know, get voters to register. The visible signs. Of yeah, and so it was easy to unite. Now, in a, especially the pro and the uh, Obama race neutral era, they have public policies that have the same effect that our leaders don't attack or deal with. And as a result, I don't think we've made the progress, locally or nationally, in terms of uh, translating our political and electoral victories into social and economic benefits for the people. Do you so think anything it has to do with the cynicism that voters have now? We've had no so doubt many about it. Black and white. politicians who have been convicted for misconduct. Black and white. And again, you know, it was easy because it said, our objective is, you know, we want to elect a black person, okay? Right. Now we have blacks elected. And again, some of our black elected officials who do things, and they say, well, whites did it. And it's true. Right. You know, said, all right. politicians, uh, not all, but yeah. many politicians white, the laws were different, right. but the environment was different. Right. Moon Landry would talk to you and say, look, I help my friends all the time, right. you know, but I said, you know, the press didn't come down to him. Right. And what our modern day, our present day, Electric fixes have to realize times have changed and right. you can't get away or Dang, shouldn't get away. Scrutinized. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, my mother used to tell me, I said, I, I learned a lot from my mom and dad. They said, Look, uh, if you're going to get ahead in life, you got to be twice as good as your white counterparts. Yeah. You know, and don't cry and complain about just, you're black. You just, just got to work twice as hard and be twice as good. Yeah. And, you know, so if our elected black officials say, Well, you know, white folks did this, yeah. that doesn't matter. No. And, and that's, that's, I guess that's my disappointment in terms of where we are now in terms of... Uh, well, that's know, my last question. Where are we now? What do you think about the future of the city as we face our tricentennial? Well, uh, our city, like everything else, is going through change, especially uh, changes created by Katrina. Okay. I mean, that was a major watershed thing that changed uh, uh, the demographics and the laws of our city. Uh, our population is changing. Uh, our educational system has changed. Uh, our demographics have changed. So we're in, we're in a, a transitional moment. Uh, before Katrina, uh, there was a thinking, all, all our major black parish officials were African American. Yeah. And there was a feeling among both <coughs> black political class and white political class that New Orleans would never have a white mayor. Unless it was a land I always felt that. Uh, and some people did, but most people thought even a land couldn't. Remember, yeah. land ran and lost twice before he was elected. Mm -hmm. Okay, twice before he elected. Once before Katrina and once after. Right. I mean, people, the city was in such chaotic condition after Nagan and the Katrina that he won. Right. Uh, but the question now is, you know, will we have, will our next mayor be white or black? And the next question now in terms of the return of our public school system to the Orleans Parish School Board, right. what will that mean in terms of the so-called changes or reform, whatever you want to put it, that have been made, that were implemented after Katrina, but were started before Katrina? And our demographics are changing. I mean, teachers were always a backbone right. of our society. I mean, my mother wanted me to be a teacher, okay? Uh, and our teacher class literally wiped out after Katrina, 7,000, you know. Yeah, my wife was one of them. You know, and again, a lot of those folks didn't return. I always say the biggest impact of Katrina was not necessarily physical, but what it did to our black middle class. Yeah. You know, and those teachers were professionals, what it had on our kids, okay, in terms of versus the young Teach for America kids who come in two years and leave, you know, and no, no role work. models. Yeah. Uh, what it did for our economy. Right. Because black teachers used black attorneys, black accountants, you know, uh, dealt with blacks in a professional way, and that's gone. Yeah. Black doctors left the hospitals. Yeah. So one of the biggest effects that Katrina had that I always argue, you know, was the, imp was the dispersion of our black middle class, right. especially teachers, Houston, doctors, Atlanta, and everything else. Dallas. That's right. And again, these folks had the skills to survive in those areas. Yeah. And they didn't have to spend extra money to send their kids to parochial schools because they had good schools. Right. So while the lower economic African Americans could go and come back and sometimes were sent back, the middle class blacks could stay and live a better life without the headaches that we had to struggle in down here. 
And we lost a lot of them. That's right. So that was the biggest thing. Now, our city's changing. Our, demo, our demographics are changing. Uh, after the storm, we had the, uh, the Bring Back New Orleans Committee that came up with some public policies that were frightening. The green dots, uh, shrinking our city size, uh, uh, converting to charter schools. Some people yeah. say privatized schools. Yeah. All those things have impact. And still today, uh, the efforts will be in terms of our criminal justice system, uh, the fights over the jails, the size of the jails, uh, the size of our city, you know, where our public dollars are going to be spent. Should we cut off the city at the canal? You know, I said uh, uh, housing, gentrification, you know, how do we use uh, our zoning? I mean, I, I remember, I said, I was part of a group that opposed the so-called master plan, the voting master plan. And not because we were poor. I was, I've always been an advocate for master plan, but we were poor to the process. Right. They wanted us to give the master plan, unwritten master plan, the force of law, you know, to, de to determine how a city will be developed. And those are the type of race-neutral policies that I argue for, that some of our leaders should be looking at, that have an impact on poor people, people of color and everything else, uh, and they're race-neutral. Well, how do you explain that when you have a majority of black council? Well, I think sometimes uh, it's a lack of history because I think of these I think all of them are smart, but I don't I don't think they want to fight. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and sometimes it's not easy to take a controversial position. Right. You know, especially when the newspaper is back in it. You know, when the political class. Money is a key when they can raise money from the white business establishment. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about uh, were the alphabet soups that I grew up with. Ku, So, Bo. Right. When we were operating and had yeah. our friends running, tips, we would come up with money. When all those guys would come up with, in any of those organizations, we would go to the bank, usually Liberty Bank, sign a note for $2,000, $5,000. Right. So when our candidates would run, they would start off with a base Right. From their friends of twenty five, sometimes a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. The younger guys and ladies don't have that. So they have to they're more reliant on the more traditional conservative business thing. So again, where you get your money determines, you know, who you're gonna listen to. Well your treasure is that's where you're holding. That's right. That's right. But you're downtown. The downtowners are usually more optimistic and willing to do more with less. So uh, is there any optimism for the future of the city? I think so. Uh, and again, uh, we do have a generational gap in our city in terms of people like me who are an old dinosaur now, Sydney Lambert and Don, and our new generation. I mean, it's, and it's not just New Orleans, it's everywhere you see it, okay? They have a different view of things. They didn't come up and see what we saw, okay? Right. Uh, usually they're more educated. Yeah. I think they're smarter. But sometimes they lack the appreciation in terms of you know, why they why they being elected. <laughs> Ron, it's been a pleasure. Okay. A pleasure. Thank you.